Well, I've been told I'm the hype man, so let's do our best to get this right. Thank you. Friends, family, and community, it's a great to see you all here today. Thank you so much for coming to our home, Ordot Brewing Company, as we host Mr. Emhoff and Dr. Biden. When you own a microbrewery, asking for your kid's absence from school for an event you're hosting can be uncomfortable. Today it was an honor. It is also an honor to have all of you here joining us. Thank you for spending your time with us. Now please join me in, my wel in the welcoming my wife, Andy Pernsteiner, as well as the second, second gentleman and the first lady of the United States of America. Wow. 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 It's, first of all, Wes, the uh, first gentleman of Did I say that? Or Doc Brewing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks so much. And you've got a wonderful voice. I mean, uh, we were impressed backstage. Um, it's so great to be back in Michigan because you know how to elect Democrats. We, we spent a lot of time here in 2020 during that campaign. And we turned Michigan blue then, and we're gonna do it again in 2024, right? And this is so awesome. I get to travel today with my good friend, our wonderful First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden. Thank you. Here we go again. Here we go again. All right, all right, all right. Hold on. I'm going to start this speech the right way. We're going to win this election in 2024, right? And we are going to make sure that Donald Trump doesn't get anywhere near that White House ever again. And we are going to win because people just like you who are showing up to fight for the issues that all Americans care about, good paying jobs, affordable health care, and our freedoms, especially our reproductive freedoms. We need to protect that. And we're going to win because of the power of women, and the power of women right here in Michigan. And you know who is afraid of you? Donald Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump is afraid of you, and he should be. Uh, we're also going to win because we have an amazing president. We have an amazing vice president. <laughs> who happens to be my wife, Kamala Harris. <laughs> so let me just take a step back. Um, it wasn't that long ago. I was, I was a lawyer in LA. Uh, I was raising two kids. Uh, I didn't have much time for politics. I was a, I was a single dad. I was trying to do my best to balance my work and raising Colonella. Um, about 11 or 12 years ago, I got set up on a blind date and I fell in love with this woman named Kamala Harris. And um, at that time, she was a busy lawyer, just like I was. She was the Attorney General of California. A few years after that, she got elected to the United States Senate from California. And a few years after that, she became our first woman vice president. But think about that. Think about that. 10 or 11 years ago, I was out there 
you know, again, raising kids, just trying to get everything together, and now I'm here as the first second gentleman. So it's a surreal turn, for sure. <laughs> but I guess you can say I get it. Like, I, I've been out there. I mean, my experience for so long uh, was like everyone else's. I was worried about the economy. I was worried about the health and safety of my family and my parents. Uh, as a parent, I just wanted to make sure that my kids, Cole and Ella, had a better life, that we left the world in a better place than, than how we found it. I've been a lawyer for a long time, over 30 years. So as a lawyer, I care about our democracy. I care about our Constitution. I care about our rule of law. And as an American, I love our country. I just want what's best for all of us not just for Democrats. I want what's best for all of us. So that's, that's kind of how I came to the table. But for the past few years, um, I've been very lucky. I've gotten a, to have a front row seat to the Biden-Harris administration. And let me make one thing clear. We must keep Joe Biden in the White House. We have to keep Joe Biden in the White House. Because, let's be honest, in the first term, Joe Biden is literally going to go down in history as one of the most consequential presidents of all time, based on the accomplishments. And we also need more women like Kamala Harris in office. She's done an incredible job as vice president. She is with the president at every turn. She is with this administration every turn, whether it's in the Situation Room, the Oval Office, around the globe, meeting with other world leaders on behalf of the United States of America, standing up to dictators, fighting for our freedom. That is my wife, Kamala Harris, and I am so proud of her. And we need more women leaders in this country. Not just in politics. We need them in industry. We need them in the military. We need them in education. We just need more women in leadership. And as for me, I want to make sure I may be the first, second gentleman of all time, but I better not be the last. <laughs> Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, they are fighting for all of us, but especially they are fighting for the women in Michigan and the women in this country. What they've already accomplished has been extraordinary. Lowest unemployment rate for women in 70 years. They're narrowing the pay gap. A lot of work to be done, but that pay gap is getting narrowed. Historic investments in child care. Historic funding under programs like the Violence Against Women Act and lower prescription drug costs, uh, lower health care premiums, and of course, uh, this is something that my wife has, has been on the forefront of, fighting for reproductive freedom. This, this is a full-blown health care crisis in this country right now caused by Donald Trump and the Supreme Court in that horrific Dobbs decision. This is completely unfair. This is a Trump-caused crisis. And the way I think about it is this. I have an 83-year-old mother. I have a 24-year-old daughter. How is it possible that we're going to have a world where my 83-year-old mother would have more rights than my 24-year-old daughter? That is completely wrong, and it's unacceptable, and we must change it. Now, you're lucky in Michigan. You've got some incredible leaders here, like Gretchen Whitmer and... Uh, and, and she has a dog named Doug. I'm telling you, that's like our little bond. Dana Nessel, Jocelyn Benson, Debbie Stabenow. So many strong women here in Michigan are leading the fight for your reproductive freedom. But those, those freedoms could go away here in Michigan if Trump wins, and we cannot let that happen. We have to fight back. And I'm not talking about this just to women. I talk about this to men. I talk about this not only with my daughter, I talk about this with my son who just got married, is thinking about having a family, and now they have to think about where are they gonna live? Where are they gonna work because of this horrific 
situation as a result of the Dobbs decision. It's got to change. All right, where are we at right now? This is a binary election. There is such a split screen uh, going on right now. We remember, well, you need to remember what it was like under Donald Trump. You have to remember what it was like even before COVID. The economy was not great. It was not. It was tax cuts for the biggest corporations and the richest people. It was a skyrocketing deficit. There was a Muslim ban. There was him cozying up to dictators and praising dictators on the world stage. There was chaos. Do you remember that chaos every single day? Then COVID hit. I would say the biggest dereliction of duty by any president in the history of this country, letting hundreds of thousands of our fellow countrymen die because of not paying attention and lying about COVID. Remember that happened. And then when Joe Biden and Kamala Harris beat Donald Trump, and we beat him right here in Michigan, <laughs> Unlike every other president up to that point, he refused, he refused to accept the fact that we beat him like a drum and he <laughs> lost. To this day, he still cannot accept that fact. And it is outrageous, it's un-American, and it's not what we stand for. But because of that, there was an inter inter insurrection at the Capitol yeah. on January 6th. That happened because of Donald Trump. And let's compare that to Joe Biden. Decent man, great American, a patriot, cares about us, puts all of us first, not himself. And then look at the results. Like I said, he's gonna go down in history just on this term alone as one of the great presidents of all time. Best economic recovery of any country in the entire world by just about every metric. Wages are rising, stocks are soaring, businesses, especially small business, are opening all over the place. There's access to capital. We've restored our reputation on the world stage. But we lose all of that if Donald Trump wins and we cannot let that happen. Let me close with this. He's a bully. He is a bully. I have fought bullies my entire life. So is Joe Biden, so is Kamala Harris. And you know the best way to beat a bully? Is at the ballot box. So we are gonna show him that this bully, this person who is against everything that this great country stands for, everything against what Joe Biden stands for and what Kamala Harris stands for, We've got to show that we're better than this and we're going to come out and we're going to win this election and we are going to do it right here in Michigan. Now, speaking about powerful women, um, there's two on my left, but I'm a, the pleasure of introducing uh, our host from Ordock Brewing, um, talking about changing the face of what has been a male-dominated industry, the, the brewing industry co-founder of Ordock and the first woman to be president of the Michigan Brewers Guild. And here's the best part. She got reelected to a second term, just like we're gonna do for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Well, thank you, Second Gentleman M. Hoff. That was a very kind introduction. Too, a little too kind. Um, good afternoon. My name is Andrea, but growing up, I was known as Andy by friends and family. Um, the name stuck, and that's how I'm known here at the brewery as well. Our team will sometimes get sales calls, you know, the calls where they come in and, and uh, they say, oh, I've, I've got to speak to Andy. And, and usually our team will say, you know, you're going to have to leave a message. And more often than not, those callers will say, uh, can you just make sure that he gets that message? Um, you know, never thinking that perhaps the owner, um, Andy, that they're trying to get in touch with is actually a woman. 
Ultimately, a note will end up on my desk. It will say, uh, so-and-so tried to get in touch with you, and they were looking for Andy, the man. <laughs> and we all have a good laugh about it. Uh, a lot of the conversations I have with other women in the business community, they revolve around um, you know, really just the critical role that women play in our society. Um, those women must balance career and family and face a stigma um, that's there when they're almost forced to choose or if they don't choose. And sometimes they don't even have the freedom to choose at all. I think we can all agree that respect for women is not a characteristic that's held by all candidates in this presidential election. Um, and not just in their words, um, but in how the decisions and policies were made. Decisions and policies that threaten our health care and our freedom. But it's not just women. When I see these stigmas continue to divide our nation, it makes me feel sad. We try to raise our kids to have strong beliefs and be respectful of others. But they are constantly bombarded with examples of how not to treat other people kindly. So for me, when I think about choosing the leaders of our country and how we're shaping our future, I think about my children. I want my kids to... <laughs> I want my kids to live in a world where they feel safe, where they have the resources they need, and where they, and where they can say how they feel and not be afraid. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, they respect these ideals and they respect women. They empower us and they're fighting for our rights, our freedom, and our families. And now it is my honor to introduce a woman who could have quit her career anytime, but she found balance in career and family and overcame the stigma following her passion while staying true to herself. She continues to teach at a community college. She is a champion of women's health research, and she is a card-carrying member of the teachers' union. <laughs> Please join me in giving a big UP welcome to our first lady, Dr. Jill Biden. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for that introduction, and to you and Wes for hosting us today at this amazing brewery. And I love that you brought your kids here. Now the kids got off school. <laughs> and you kids know I'm a teacher. <laughs> well, it's so nice to see you here. And I guess we must have a lot of union members in the audience when I heard that. Yeah. <laughs> love the union. So really, Wes, it's incredible what you two have built here, and you're absolutely right. This election is about shaping a future that our kids can thrive in, one where they feel safe, as you said, Andy, and loved. Serving as the second spouse of the United States is something that I know a little bit about. <laughs> and Doug, you're doing an incredible job. Finding balance between your own profession and your service to our country. And isn't he the best second gentleman ever? I'm also grateful for the many state and local officials joining us here today and all the work that you're doing here in the Upper Peninsula. So I really appreciate your warm welcome because it's great to be here in Michigan. 
You know, this really is a beautiful part of the state. I, I've never been here before. So um, I, as I came in, it was it's just incredibly beautiful. I just wish I could see a little bit more of the lake, but maybe I'll see it as I go. Anyway, when I was growing up in a suburb of Philadelphia and dreamed of what my life would become, I knew that I wanted two things. A marriage like my parents that was strong and loving and full of laughter. And, as Andy said, I wanted a career. So I set out to find those two things, but my path was just a bit meandering. It was the 70s, maybe some of you might remember, <laughs> some of you. It was Vietnam, love beads, equal rights. I wore my hair down to the middle of my waist, and so did most of the men I dated. <laughs> so one day I was asked on a, out on a date from out of the blue, and that evening this handsome young senator showed up at my door. So remember what I said, it was the 70s, remember the guys we dated, you know, clogs, bell bottoms, yes, you're shaking your head, <laughs> bell bottoms, tie-dye, right? So I opened the door and I took one look at his perfect suit and his leather loafers and I thought, thank God this is only one date. <laughs> well, one date eventually turned into a marriage proposal. And, you know, okay, if I'm being completely honest, it was five proposals <laughs> because this was not part of my plan. And more than that, it wasn't just my heart that was on the line. As many of you may remember, years before, Joe's wife, Nelia, and baby daughter had been killed in an automobile accident. And the boys, Bo and Hunter, had to be in the hospital for many, many months. And after all that they had lost, I knew that if I said yes to Joe's marriage proposal, it had to be forever. Eventually, I realized that my love for Joe and the boys far outweighed any fears I had, and I said yes. But, well, thank you. <laughs> Somebody's ha happy that I married Joe. <laughs> so, but I'll never forget what Joe said next. He said, Jill, I promise you, your life will never change. <laughs> Of course, that proved to be wildly untrue. You know, life is change for all of us. We learn and we grow. We overcome heartbreaks we never could have imagined. We find wisdom and grit and empathy. But in the last few years, I've seen a different kind of change, a rupture in the foundations of our democracy a pullback of the hard-won progress that we've made. We are the first generation in half a century, as Doug said, to give our daughters a country with fewer rights than we had. Book bans, voting laws gutted, court decisions that strip away our most basic freedoms. But circumstance is not destiny. Eight years ago, Republicans flipped Michigan by a hair, a fraction of a percentage point. Remember how close that was? Yeah. 10,000 votes. They thought they could do it again in 2020. They poured in resources and they held rallies. They thought that they could out-organize you, but you proved them wrong. Yeah. <laughs> You talk to your friends and your neighbors. You call people you'd never met, and you reminded them to vote. You put on masks and hopped on Zooms. You raised money and changed minds. You gave everything you had to make Joe Biden president and Kamala Harris vice president, and you won. <laughs> Women put Joe Biden in the White House four years ago, and women are going to do it again. Because, yes! Because we know what's at stake. 
I've been so proud of how Joe has placed women at the center of his agenda, starting with his historic pick for Vice President Kamala Harris. <laughs> President Biden is fighting for a national law that would restore Roe's protections. He is defending reproductive rights, and yes, that means protecting IVF and access to contraception. And as Doug said, Joe is lowering the cost of prescription drugs and health insurance, expanding access to maternal health services and affordable child care. He appointed Katanji Brown Jackson and he's making historic investments in our economy. Joe has spent his entire career lifting up women, but Donald Trump, he has spent a lifetime tearing us down and devaluing our existence. He mocks women's bodies, disrespects our accomplishments, and brags about assaults. He, yes, he boasts about killing Roe v. Wade, saying he's proudly the person responsible for overturning nearly 50 years of precedent. And he wants to punish women who are seeking reproductive health care. And now he's saying he supports states being able to monitor women's pregnancies to enforce extreme abortion bans he's unleashed. Donald Trump is dangerous to women and to our families. We simply cannot let him win. We can't wake up the day after the election like we did in 2016. No, no. terrified of the future ahead of us. Remember waking up that morning and thinking, oh my God, what just happened? What are we going to do now? Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to reelect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. That's how. So how are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? Just look around you. Women for Biden Harris. We're going to do what we did in 2020 and 2022. We're going to talk to your friends about why this election is so important. Tell them what's at stake. Sign up for phone banks and canvassing shifts. And we're going to meet this moment as if our rights are at stake because they are, as if our democracy is on the line, because it is. We will decide our future, because here's the thing about men like Donald Trump. They underestimate our power because they don't understand it. They see us working late shifts and making grocery lists and driving to soccer practices and volunteering, caring for our parents and raising money for those in need. And they think that we can be ignored. They don't know that our to-do lists are our battle maps. And when our bodies are on the line, when our daughters' futures are at stake, when our country and its freedoms hang in the balance, we, women, are immovable and unstoppable. That's what our power looks like, and it's time we show them once again just what we can do by working every single day from now until the elect till the polls close on the election day in November by electing Joe Biden and Kamala Harris by deciding the future we want the future we all need and when we do women nothing and no one can stand in our way thank you yeah.